about 30, 40 people. Uh, we have a uh, members, a club members meeting every month, although we kind of leave that battle over the summer because it's so easy sometimes to start going to the summer, so we will probably go. Uh, we all have club meetings from April to September, uh, but starting September, actually starting this weekend, we're going to have our first meeting, and then we will continue monthly until we close. Uh, right now, our membership is around 45 people. And it's going. Um, so there's a main presentation room where we have meetings. Um, we have members' nights, so those are special nights for the membership three, four times a year. Uh, we also have public observing, and that is the last Saturday of every month. Uh, those are free events. Anybody can come. Uh, around 7 30 is when it starts, and it continues until 9 9 30. And again, like our kind of regular schedule, the members, the don't have a public meeting like April until December because it doesn't get started until 1930. Okay, um, we do a lot of public education and outreach. Um, most of that we are talking about astronomy uh, as a subject of interest. We don't actually often do presentations like I'm doing tonight about the club. It's usually more about astronomy, but I'll tell you a little bit about Uh, we do labs for the U of L. We first in third year. Um, students in astrophysics, they come down to do the tutorial there. A lot of times when you're in astrophysics, you never have, we never actually look through the telescope. We say you come down to our site and you actually look at some of the stuff that you're doing on the telescope. Uh, we've got a few uh, research programs going, although we usually aren't the main driver work working with other people. So we've got a, uh, a project that uh, we're doing with that back to college. Um, they've got a magnetic monitor down at our site. They're looking at uh, um, magnetic lines and aurora. Um, we don't actually use fundraising and work speed that much anymore because we've got a better sort of funding than we had in the past. And then there's star parties, which are, you know, larger dormant events for people coming to the Sometimes that's at the club, although more often it's at a more remote location where you can get those from. Okay? Uh, okay, so this is what it looked like in the summertime. Uh, when we had some rain, which we didn't get much of this summer. Uh, this is down on the ground, just off the observing deck. You can just see it's got nothing to do with the storm, but you can see the faint line of an old railroad that went through there way, way back, like, a few million years ago. And that, if you look at satellite view, you can kind of see where that old railroad is. It's kind of made a kind of thing with the old TV, and you can see the old railroad is there. It's got a fake back to the middle corner. Here's a, a sample of some of the gear that we have. Uh, this is a fairly old slide, but we, uh, we still actually have most of that gear. We can actually add it to it. Um, again, another old slide. This is, these are just some of the earlier founding members. Uh, we've got a program, or had a program, that's it's not running really correctly, but we're really monitoring the year, so the year goes to the side and the operator is able to see the track. And we've got a guy that's doing some research on um, solar, um, solar emissions that specifically is on So he's, he's lucky to get to see the sun very much for that to see the money to see the sun and get to the afternoon. It's cost to stay there that way. Uh, here's the Aurora, and that's going to be at the college. Um, that's a little bit shot in the Aurora. Uh, I would say three, four times a year around the city. Hard to predict when it's going to happen, of course, but uh, if you're down there fairly often, you're going to see it. Uh, we do some work around light pollution awareness. Um, I think we're kind of all familiar with you know, this problem in terms of the storm. Unfortunately, when you kind of look north of the border, you can see that there's still a 
here, in the center, you can see a line that will be appearing up here. And then March, it will be over here. Okay, so there's a bunch of constellations for summer Um Like I said, there's 80 of them. A lot of the ones in the northern hemisphere are named after uh, characters in Greek mythology. Um, not too much in the south, because they have the moon until they explore the Europe got down there. A lot of them have to do with the technology of the day, so there's one that's the furthest, and one that's the, the uh, galleon, or the sailing ship, and so on and so forth. Um, but the names of the constellations that we are acquainted with in the North of the United States, they A lot of them come from the Odyssey, and there is a bit of a debate around whether or not the Odyssey and the Odyssey or actually kind of map the heavens in that at the poem, or whether it was the other way around, the only constellation person in the other poem to describe the constellation. No one knows the answer to that. But you got Taurus of Bolak, the Zodiacal, or kind of the Zodiac, so is Aries, so is Pisces. And the Zodiac, just really briefly, is the set of constellations that the planet and the sun and the moon and so at that point you're going to find Aries, Pisces, Sagittarius, uh, Leo, Cancer, Gemini. All those constellations are along this line here. It's called the Ecliptic. So if you kind of think of the structure of the solar system, we're on Earth, all the planets and the sun and the moon are all more or less in the same point. So as you spin and we're watching this stuff, uh, by the sun, it is a whole line, right? More or less, because all the planets are the sun. So that's why this ecliptic is the track where the sun, the moon, and the planets are going to appear. Probably, when people were looking up in the sky long, long ago, well, they noticed that some of these shiny things that make the planet move and let them in. So the ones that they move from one must be important. Meaning those, getting those constellations in particular are important because those are the ones that keep the moving according to the stars uh, where they land. Okay. Uh, Big Dipper and Little Dipper, most people know that one, right? Uh, Big Dipper tells us where the North Star is. The North Star, all these two stars in Big Dipper say that's the North Star. And that, if you were to slide a stick uh, to the sun straight up into the sky, it would get the most up. So that, that's the answer to the location that is upwards. And we, we're lucky because Polaris happens to be really near that spot. Not exactly on, but it's pretty close. Some of them up here, that's not true. They don't have a star that corresponds to where the sun is. So they're in. They have a much harder time aligning with the thing. They need to go up here to pick up North Star and go back. Okay, here's the line. If you have a pair of your this way here, here's the line, 23,000 belt, there's the shoulder, this is the field here, this is the line go. They're always talking about the line go on Star Trek, right? That's the line go. Field here. So this is the line belt, and then hanging down from the line belt, what you see is the middle of the stars. You take the binoculars, and you look at the middle one, this one right here. It's not actually a star, it's fuzzy. You can see a cloud on it. And that is actually to do a really good telescope and a camera. Uh, this is what you see. Right. So this here,
that coming from millions and millions of yeah. light years away. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
would be fine. Um, so we're saying for our conception of life, it's got to be in the inevitable zone. It's got to be in the Goldilocks zone. You also have to worry about vegetation. You also have to worry about the thin on the planet. So if it's not thin, you got one side that's going to be really hot, and the other one that's going to be unbearably cold. Uh, you have to worry about vegetation. You have to worry about you have to have an atmosphere that's pretty much the, the, the radiation from the sun. There's lots and lots and lots of conditions that have to be satisfied before the conditions would be um, correct for life as we know it. And that truth of a number that's still for the effect of the But, you know, the uh, 20 years it won't be speculation. We'll have a good sense of how many of these kind of things are going to be heard in the Okay, anything else? So, if you're interested in more of this kind of stuff, look on our website, get us a call, take a look during the club. Maybe come, start by coming to one of the public observing um, last Saturday of every month, start to serve the public. Great. And I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm kind of at least serving myself, so uh, I gave a nice result for the group here, because I know there's a lot of people that have class at this time on Wednesday nights or something, so they can take a look at the next step of it. Opportunities to do that. But they do a membership here. You can go uh, $50 for adults. If you're a student, you have your ID card, you can get it for $25. And I did ask if maybe you can get it for the group. And they can't do that. But that's, that's You're all great people. We, we, we only have one class of student membership, unfortunately. We can't, we can't play that too much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. This one's yours. This one's mine. Yeah. This one's actually a laser on the screen. Oh, how's it? Yeah. I think that's going to solve a lot of problems. I see the laser in the green and I'll cut that laser off my screen. Yeah. You are going to be the laser. Well, I know the we, we have to be really careful because we're not that far from the airport, so I'll oh, right. watch what you're talking about. I know the Texas Circuit probably has like really high-powered uh, lasers that are yeah. calibrated. Actually, one, one thing you might not be aware of with the Texas Circuit is that we have, they've done a big data dump on the water and they have a lot of Burning of food, which basically says that 
if you want to assert that something is true, you actually have to present evidence for it to be such. If you claim that somebody uh, is a murderer, then you need to take that to trial. And it's the burden of proof is on the investigators and the police that are doing the research into um, the murder case to find the burden of to find evidence that will um, eventually lead to um, a conclusive uh, understanding of what happened. And the same thing, say Bigfoot, if you want to believe Bigfoot is real, you need to actually present that uh, that proof that it is. And the same here in the area you apologize And then you've got something called, uh, I've called here the dynamic trio, and uh, you find this quite often. You have the skeptic, this is the guy right there. He's the one who is not going to ever believe that uh, aliens exist. You can show him all the proof. He has uh, aliens land in his backyard and kidnapped his wife, and he still think it was a hoax. Um, and yeah, he gets this really uh, negative uh, impression of being uh, so. And then on the other hand, you have the believer. This guy is usually so drunk out truly, you're never ever going to get him back to reality. Um, and then, of course, you have the indecisive. This guy is usually the one who uh, really doesn't want to make an assertive decision because he doesn't want to be wrong and he doesn't um, remain neutral. Because he can say for 100% uh, certainty, uh, you say, for example, a Gnosticism, you don't uh, believe in God, but you also don't have any evidence that God doesn't exist. You can say for 100% certainty that you don't know. Uh, but it's important to remember that a lot of the time discoveries and, and things in that area of research are conducted, um, the, the truth comes when you, when you make mistakes. And so it's okay to make mistakes, and it's okay for a person who is indecisive to take a step on either side of uh, this white ticket fence upon the sit, uh, because they can make mistakes and they can learn from that. Now, let's present you with an idea of the three different options, and there are these three categories. And I mean, most people from what I talk to, they definitely fall into the indecisive category because, well, there's the almost statistics about life in the universe, but is there really any proof that it's actually come and visited and interacted with? people before, but as you'll find with most things today, it's actually on a spectrum, where on one end, you have don't believe, and on the other hand, you have everything is caused by aliens, and both of them are equally as absurd, and most people will fall somewhere in the middle, but they can be on any degree of this spectrum, and so it's important to understand that, well, these three categories present very good, um, very, um, well, I'll say it's not good, but um, entertaining, very entertaining programs. Uh, these uh, people are the cast of Discovery Channel's UFO Hunters, and I mean, I'm going to want to sit down for uh, half hour and 40 minutes and watch these guys back at each other because they can't really make up their minds on what evidence they're being presented. And so it presents this false idea of what it really means to be skeptical. Because if you've ever seen, say, for instance, X Files, if you only watch a couple episodes of it, then you know that Mulder is going to be the believer, and Scully is going to be the skeptic, and she's always going to disregard everything he presents as truth. But that's only because you take a small sample from it. But you can actually watch a larger uh, array of episodes from the X Files series and see that. There's actually some really good, really well written episodes where uh, Scully actually believes in something so strongly and Mulder thinks it's absolutely absurd and that um, she should just drop what, what she's trying to prove there. Um, and so it presents this false idea in the media of what it means to be skeptical because it's really important to understand that it's a tool that needs to be utilized and it needs to be uh, utilized correctly in order to find. The truth. And then, so, I don't know, just a fall of the class, and it really feels if you're more like a believer or the skeptic or you being decisive. Just an 
had to pull his up. You know, tap dance if you don't want to. I feel like I'm more indecisive, but more leaning towards the leader because, again, the universe is so large that it's impossible. In my opinion, it's almost impossible for us to be on the living being. But that's just me. Right. And I mean, that's one of the things that I talked about last week is that there's this idea that the statistics are so large. And so the argument doesn't come into whether or not life exists. I, I really did back to climate change. And people deny climate change. They're not actually denying that climate is changing. I mean, you look at the last month, it was five hurricanes or something like that. That's absolutely insane. Um, so you can't deny that the climate is changing. What they're arguing is whether or not humans have any involvement in that change. Similarly, with the UFO uh, phenomenon, people aren't denying that there might be life in the universe. It comes down to this question as to whether or not it's actually come uh, to the planet and if there's any evidence of that. And then, so I'll start with you with a really good video from uh, TED Talk to give you an idea of why people believe in weird things. Alright, that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, some of the reasons that would cause people to believe in the supernatural. Obviously humans are pattern seeking creatures, you want to uh, see faces and things, and uh, obviously there's that preconceived conception where if you're told that something is looking like this, then you're automatically going to look for that. And, and the only reason the, those words about Satan in, in the reverse of the song makes sense is because you already know what you're going to be looking for. Um, now, I took a Psychology 1000 course at the university here in my first year, and it was really fascinating. Uh, one of the lectures was done by Dr. Vogue uh, on campus, and he did an entire lecture, a uh, three-hour lecture on subliminal messages, including things like that, and looking into uh, all of these claims that were made in, in terms of subliminal messages that were used by marketers to try and get you to buy products you otherwise uh, wouldn't buy. And you find that the whole thing is just complete bogus because of this bad science that was done in the area of research into that. So I'll talk here about uh, some tools that can actually be used for this skepticism. And the first one, you've probably heard of this, is something called Occam's Razor. And it basically states that if you're given a problem, generally speaking, the simplest solution is the one that's correct. You want to go adding all of these exponentials onto, uh, onto the answer because then it, it makes it uh, less accurate. But you'll find that I, I personally don't like this because there's a really big problem with Occam's Razor. And that, that makes this assumption that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between simplicity and accuracy. And it's completely false. There is there's no proof that, that simple things actually turn out to be uh, the correct. And I'll give you a perfect example uh, here right now. Davidson in German, 1927. If you've taken any physics class in high school or university, you have probably come across this at some point, and that is the double slit experiment. This experiment that was set up in 1927, where they had this, divi uh, this divisor wall that had two slits so a particle could go through, one here and one here, and they had uh, a particle. Um, accelerator that was shooting beams of particles one at a time, and so it would go through either slit A or it would go through slit B. And you find that on the back side, what you'd expect to see is these two markings on the detector that you'd find this grouping of particles here and here because that's where they came through the detector. But what they found was that they actually found this fringe pattern that could only be explained if the particles were actually away. And you say, well, that's crazy. How could that happen unless the particle had somehow interacted with itself and it had gone through both slits at the same time and come out a wave on the other end? Well, you see, Occam's razor would tell us that you actually have a stray particle over here that's coming through your experiment and interfering with it. And so that's what's causing this miscalculation in your experiment. And so you set the whole thing up again. 
and you run the experiment, you've got your detector, you've got your double slit, and you've got your particle. And you find that even though you've uh, ruled out all possibilities that another particle could be interfering with your experiment, you still get a fringe pattern back here. And uh, that doesn't make any sense. That's this is crazy. Well, it's because the answer is not rocket science, it's just quantum physics. And it's hard, really hard, and it's really hard for a really good reason. You know, so you'll find that it's also one of the most accurate scientific models that has ever been uh, uh, presented. And so you can see just from quantum physics alone that simplicity doesn't necessarily mean uh, accuracy because something that's really complicated actually turns out to be the correct answer. Now, another example of this could be, say, for example, you have a bunch of police, they show up at a murder scene, and uh, they find a guy standing in the bedroom. He's got a gun in his hand, and his wife is dead on the bed. Uh, well, logically, he's got the gun, his wife is dead, he shot her, okay, let's lock him up for uh, forever and let's throw away the key. Um, but no, that's not, that's not what you do. You actually have to uh, take it to trial. And then they do this investigation, and they find out that there's all this other stuff going on in, in, in his life, and his wife was having an affair, and, and all of these other things. And it turns out that somebody snuck into this guy's bedroom, and stole his gun and, and shot his wife and uh, that's why his fingerprints are on the gun because it was his gun that was used for the murder and so you can't make these assumptions based on simplicity alone until you do the investigation into it. And then you end up in this situation where you're making claims from the top of a slippery slope. Has anybody here ever watched any episode of Ancient Aliens? Okay, yeah, so all of you have. Now you see, the show is really entertaining. I mean, I just binge watch it sometimes just because I can't, I can't put it down. It's just so fascinating. But there's a really big problem in the show is that it makes all of these assumptions and they build upon each other and they get more complex and you end up with this massive interlocking web where all of these things are related and then it becomes this impossible to discern truth, fiction, fact, and lies, and fantasy, and then what happens is that there might be this one or this two really, really good claims that the show makes that actually turn out to be true. And you might find that there are certain things that the ancient alien show claims that are true, um, but because it's um, attached with all of these other things that they present with it, you end up in a situation where um, people just would disregard the whole thing because it's just a mess. They're not going to go and sort through it and, and look at what might be uh, real and what might not be. And um, so then you end up in this situation where, well, uh, but everything's being caused by aliens, and you, you ask these questions, or why is the sky blue, uh, why are we here, why was that calculus test that's so darn hard? Well, the answer is aliens, and there's a reason this picture exists. For that reason, it's because it becomes a joke at that point. Hey, welcome. Anyway. <laughs> you came in at the best slide. <laughs> so that's what happens when you make these claims that go well beyond what you can actually verify and prove is that people just disregard everything and even if one or two things you have said actually turn out to be uh, truthful they're not going to listen to words you have to say past them. Now another um, now how do we go about solving this? And it's really about having a healthy skepticism. And what does it mean to have a healthy skepticism? Is that um, whatever you've done before is not going to bias you in, in your current research. It doesn't matter if the last 100 or 200 pictures that you've looked at 
and investigated are clearly explainable and they're not actually pictures of UFOs, um, that doesn't mean that the very next picture you look at is just automatically going to be disregarded as, as not a UFO. Um, unless, of course, they all come from the same photographer, in which point you have the ca uh, in which point you have the case of the boy who cried wolf too many times, and you should probably stop taking uh, photos from that photographer. Um, and it's important to know that it's okay to change your opinion on things too, because many people that believe in this phenomena of UFOs and aliens and extraterrestrials didn't initially start out that way. They generally had something in their life that led them to that, either it was a personal experience, or in my case, I've never had a personal experience. I found all of this stuff online, and it just seemed so compelling, so far, uh, so much evidence that something, like I said, with ancient aliens, at least one person, I feel, has to be telling the truth somewhere. And so um, you find that there's generally these uh, situations that will lead a person into believing this. And so it's okay to change your opinion at any point. And it's okay to go back on it, too, if you find that you don't actually have any evidence or proof in the field of uh, aliens. And it's okay to backtrack on that and say, you know, I might have thought at one point that, that this was real, but I genuinely don't believe that anymore. But you'll find that with every uh, man-made system of, of rationality, it is inherently flawed in, in one way or another, and this is the major problem with skepticism. All right, so you can see there, that's what happens when you take the video and take step. Oh, yeah. I don't think they okay. I'm changing her to her to see her. It looks like she's getting some time. I'm not really sure. I don't know. It's ending. It's kind of a sign. It's 2016. Yeah. I didn't hear me. That's a probably fair human side note. 2016 looks like this video. <laughs> So yeah, basically that's skepticism when you take it to the extreme. Now, another question I took up uh, in the past summer was a philosophy in the film part that was uh, taught by one of the professors, uh, I don't remember his last name, <laughs> was, uh, first name is Paul, and he's a really cool guy, and he got to watch a ton of different movies and then talk about like the philosophical idea thing. I mean, the very first thing we started from day one um, was Inception. And this idea of looking at, do you really know if the reality that you're in is actually the one that you think it is? And then we went into further studies and, and look at, well, does it even really matter? If all of your sensory input data is the same, um, is that all that really matters? Is the sensory input data? And it doesn't matter if you're bringing it back because your experiences are no different. Um, that's a really cool area of, of philosophy as well with many Descartes and, and all of that. Um, but the definitely important thing to take away from that is that sometimes it's, it's, uh, there's certain things that have to be taken as known facts before you can get to the higher level uh, of things like ufology exist on the assumption that uh, everything else like the brain and the that are just going to ignore all of that and move on to higher level discussions. And then, so, you end up with certain institutions that are actually working supporting um, a good skepticism. And this is the Center for Inquiry. It's an educational organization. Uh, they were founded in 1991 by philosopher Paul Kurtz. So you see this is a skeptical society that's been, based, that's been built by philosophers. This is definitely a big uh, area of research that they conduct as well. And in 2016, it merged with the Richard Dawkins Foundation um, for Scientific Discovery. And they also have a member, and they have a committee of people that are a part of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. And I'll show you their website here. It's really good. They've got all types of information on the website that you can look up. And that's CSIOP.org. Um, but they've got uh, new series to go and see the publications they have. Um, they've got information about their organization. This is a panel of top notch scientists. They include all kinds of people. Don't mind one of them being a big prominent member of the committee 
the skeptical part. And if you go to the research you speak to, you'll find things on creationism and, and transcendence, and you'll find things on urban legends, and they've even got an entire section down here dedicated to that. UFOs, they've got a report about bad UFOs, they've got the entire continent report here. This is an actual scientific uh, um, uh, research that the government commissioned during the 50s, and I'm going to uh, go more into detail in, in the uh, government and many black video into the actual findings of the content report. But you can look up there, go to the table of contents, and go through the entire thing um, of itself. And we've got all types of different things here. Um, and this is one of them, too. This will be mentioned in, in a video that will be shown in 10, 20 minutes or so. Um, you can talk about this website called Smoke. And this is a really good website for skepticism on absolutely everything. I'm talking, you see a Facebook post in your, in your feed, and it's like, oh, that story doesn't really seem that right. These guys are like up to date with the latest thing. I'll tell you if that Facebook post is actually complete rubbish or whether or not you should, you should believe it. So you've got things about, about Donald Trump on it. It's, it's all through the modern, but if you've got the search box, you can search all kinds of things, UFOs. And there are uh, five different uh, uh, claims that have been made throughout uh, throughout history in, in recent claims. And you can actually go on and see if there uh, evidence that has been conducted is debunking these claims. Uh, so this is a very good resource as well, in addition to the website for the CSI is called. Now, with last lecture, I talked about a ton of people that were in the area and you could feel the geophology. It's only uh, you know that I talked about some oh, oh, this that one maybe. This is hypothesis testing. This is basically saying, okay, you can send a video or a picture of a UFO. Can you actually reproduce it under conventional means? One thing to say that it was Photoshop because you've done this photo analysis, but if you can actually go out and do an identical replication yourself, you can be that much more certain in the fact that it's actually not valid. There you go, Oh, it's like flashing. Uh -huh. Oh, you're telling me to steal or something. Okay, okay. All right. Are we ready? Are we ready? Okay. One, two, three. Three. Okay, this is Monday, July 28th, uh, 620 p.m. We just released three more balloons, so we're dealing with Um, 
He was also a funder and consultant in the early days of study helping uh, Frank Drake to found that institution. And he also started his own called the Planetary Society. And this is a, an institution that's basically about looking into um, all types of really cool things. So you see it's got, what did say there? Solar system, near orbiting objects. And so they will look at uh, astrology and all types of things like that. And He's also really famous for uh, doing a 13-episode series in the 80s uh, called Cosmos. It was, it was Cosmos, the personal voyage. And um, they looked at all kinds of different things. And, and it was a really big turning point at that, at that time to be able to show the media and show people how uh, astronomy is done, how they know that the universe is this old and, and, and 13, 29 billion years old. Really, how do they know? that. Well, that was all covered in something like that. And the Cosmos actually turns out to be uh, one of the most widely watched shows on TV from the 80s to the 90s. And it was, it was a 16 episode series. You can see they revised it in 2014. This is the modern day one. This is the old one with Carl Sagan there. Um, and they talk about things like the Big Bang, space time, and the multiverse. And if you know anything about Paul and scientists, you know that if I'm going to talk about Carl Sagan and Cosmos, the next guy on the list has got to be Neil deGrasse Tyson. This guy is basically the living legacy of Carl Sagan. He was inspired in high school by, by watching him on shows like the Cosmos. And um, then now, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an American born astrophysicist, author, science co communicator. Um, he also a science educator, and he basically picked up all uh, all of the work that Carl Sagan left when he died in 1996. And uh, he's probably seen all, all types of different shows and TV shows and documentaries. And as of 2015, he even started his own podcast down here, Star Talk Radio, and he's had the interviews with all types of uh, various personalities from Joe Rogan to Dr. Nietzsche Okaku. Uh, so let's just have a look at what one of the modern day skeptics has to say about UFOs. Uh, Carl Sagan was a
Now, there's this other thing that I want to mention, and that is correlation or cause, correlation versus causation. Now, in addition to all of these other glaring classes that I've taken, I also took a statistics class, a couple of them, and they talk about this phenomena that actually happens where you can have these perfectly correlating points of data that draw a beautifully straight line on your graph, and scientifically it looks amazing and it's totally proof that some things are related because you've got this straight line. And yet, logic and reason would tell you they're completely not related at all. And I'll show you some examples of this. We've got up there organic food sales and autism over the years. And so you can see they, they follow along a very nice uh, straight path there. And something you can easily conclude from a graph such as that, that organic food is actually a leading cause of autism. And it makes perfect sense because it follows that, that perfect line. And because everything else that's ever been shown or proven in science has some kind of graph with a nice line. But you really have to look farther beyond that and use some common sense in that. Another one here. This is global average temperature versus number of pirates. And I see it's actually inverted, so the pirates are decreasing as the temperature goes up. So you can uh, easily calculate from that that global warming is actually not that bad because you know pirates are decreasing as well as the years go on. And that's a pretty good thing. Um, and let's see my sister, she, she loves pirates, so she would, she would want that to happen at all. <laughs> And then, uh, suicides by hanging and U.S. spending on science and space. So it's like, oh, well, look at that. The more we spend on science and space exploration, the more people are killing themselves. But what's more likely is that there's more people on planet Earth, period, and so you're going to have more people that are committing suicide. Another thing is uh, the detail in, in all the data that you're gaining, such as the space on Mars that was shown previously. And when you get lower quality data, you can make assumptions that are far more spectacular than when you have the high quality resolution data that actually tells you what's really going on in the situation. Now, this is a video that I put in here. Uh, I don't think I'm going to actually show it because it's, it's fairly long. It's 23 minutes. It's from a TED talk. And uh, the extra presentation from the Astronomy Society was a bit longer than I expected. It was definitely really good. So I will link this in an email or something. And you can watch it on your own time. But it's actually really good. It talks to, it's really funny too. And it talks about this idea of denial or skepticism and how to know the difference between the two. And really denial is when you have such abundance of facts that something's taken place, such as people that deny that the Holocaust exists. That's an absolute certain thing that took place. Or people that deny that the moon landing took place, that's an absolute certain thing that took place. And so it's important to know this balance between denial and skepticism. Um, so that's a very good video. I'll link it in the email. And then, so relating all of this back to ufology, because we have the burden of proof that I mentioned at the beginning of the class, it lies on us to actually find and assess the data and come to fruition with the answers. Now, the unfortunate side to that is, is that, like I said, I want to believe. That's from the famous uh, X-Files UFO poster. And it basically, it, it states in itself that the people that want to believe in this phenomena are the ones that are actually going to do research or legitimately talk and think about it. And so, of course, if they come to some grand uh, discovery, people are going to say, well, of course there's aliens and stuff, because you believed in it before, so now you're, you're going to believe in it now. But it's important to remember that skepticism means you can change your opinion, so you can start off not believing in UFOs and do all the scientific investigation and, and come to believe in them, or the exact opposite can happen. The unfortunate side is most people in legitimate fields of research, unless you're in astronomy or you're in cosmology, don't actually ever think about this. Uh, but you can be certain that people like Neil deGrasse Tyson or, or Michio Kaku or anybody that does anything in theoretical physics for that matter, they have to answer at some point to the press do you believe in aliens? And they have to come and, and have uh, a, an 
legitimate answer that they can actually stand behind, and generally the case is their answer tends to be no. Now, I was given some reasons that a person might fake a paranormal experience, and that's for financial gain and publicity. That's a definite big one. If people are being paid or they're being or they're gaining popularity as a result of it, um, then you'll find that that's a general good indication that it's not actually legitimate. I have to, to sit back and ask yourself too. If, if you claim that you're abducted by aliens and, and you're stealing, uh, and you're stealing sperm and eggs and all sorts of other things and doing weird sex experiments on you, I don't think you're going to be popular, and I don't think people are going to be sending you truckloads of, of cash because of it. Because you believe and you desire proof of existence to avoid being mocked, perhaps you believe in it so strongly that you want to create the evidence that would lead to a reality where you're not mocked. Or perhaps you take it as a challenge. Maybe you just want to see how well your deceptive skills are. Can you fool the entire world into believing that something you created as a host was actually genuine. And so you might take that as a challenge, or you might have many other ulterior motives. The other side to that is reasons why, or examples of good proof when examining a case. When you look at a UFO case, if you have multiple eyewitnesses, that generally tends to help. Although, if you know the grass Tyson is there, eyewitness reports are not that credible. Um, it's okay, I'm, I'm just looking. <laughs> uh, physical damage is caused to the human body. Um, if you have scars and, and things like that, um, I mean, people have definitely done a lot worse things to their own body in, in the name of a lot less. Um, but it certainly pro uh, provides more credibility to your case if you've got some kind of scar as a result of an abduction. The event is not an isolated incident. If it occurs over several days, or it occurs over several cities, and the same thing is seen over several cities, then you know that this is, even if it's an airplane, yeah, that's all it is, it's traveling in a path that would lead people in multiple cities to see it, or that it's reoccurring over several days, means that you didn't just hallucinate it because you were drunk the night before, because tonight you're not drunk at all. Threats to life or uh, personal well-being are made as a result of the disclosure. If you come out and report a UFO and the men in black show up and threaten to kill your entire family and you ask the attractive statement, that's pretty good evidence that somebody somewhere has something to hide. It may not be aliens from outer space, but it's something that's worth killing you over. So it's a fairly good assumption at that point that what you actually experience is fairly uh, genuine. And then you've got photo and video evidence that exists, and rarely this is the big one. Trace materials are left on the scene. If you have some kind of unknown form of substance that was left, left as a result of a UFO landing or a UFO crashing into a tree or anything like that, um, then they actually test that. And that's going to be a big talking point of the UFO CSI course that I have set up, where we're going to look at the people that actually go out to these scenes and, and examine the actual evidence that is given to them. If information is gained that could not have possibly otherwise been known, if uh, the aliens tell you about some new amazing uh, propulsion system, this is how we actually build their UFOs, and this is how you make them fly and do all these anti gravity things, and then you actually go and you build a UFO engine based on that knowledge that you could not have otherwise gained, that's a fairly good substantial uh, reason to think that you actually got it from elsewhere and you just pull it off the internet. Um, and then this is the last video for tonight. What kinds of proof actually exist? 